Thank you for inviting me. It's been a while since I spoke. I was looking at the photographs <laughs> and thinking how badly I'd aged since I last <laughs> came to speak. Um, I think when I last came to speak, I was still a member of Parliament. So you'll have to give this this forewarning to John Brogan that um, he comes to speak here and then he has to find another job immediately, <laughs> immediately afterwards. Um, but it's, it's a great pleasure to be, to be back here speaking at this conference. I know that I'm speaking to a huge amount of experience in the room of people who have devoted their lives to campaigning for justice and for peace and for serving the people who are most marginalised in our society today. So I know that I'm, I'm speaking to friends um, and that's a really nice place to be, um, particularly when you do the kinds of work that we do, um, uh, serving those who are destitute and those who are detained. We often go out to speak to people where we're just not quite sure whether they're really going to like what we have to say. So I don't know, maybe there'll be people here who won't like what I've got to say today, but I, I, I suspect that I'm speaking to people who are like JRS, fighting for the same cause. And um, if I may say thank you, thank you for everything that you do. I know sometimes people don't know the kind of work that happens behind the scenes. A lot of the, the stuff that makes the difference is completely unseen um, and people don't say thank you, um, but we at JRS feel your friendship um, and we're really grateful for it. So that's just what I, I want to say really to, to start with. So since I um, since I last spoke here, which I think was four years ago maybe, um, uh, I went to go and work for uh, the Jesuit Refugee Service, first of all working with the international team, um, and I was on the road for most of the time then, seeing the work that JRS does in East Africa and, and the Middle East. Um, and for those of you who don't know anything about JRS, the Jesuit Refugee Service is, is an international Catholic organisation that's a work of the Society of Jesus and our mission is to accompany, to serve and to serve as companions and to advocate on behalf of refugees and those who've been forcibly displaced. And we work in around 50 countries around the world. I say around because it fluctuates, because depending on what situations are, offices are opened and projects are opened and, and then they're closed down again. Um, but we also work in most of the countries within Europe where we do slightly different work. And, and what I'm going to do today is draw quite a lot on the experience that we have um, at JRS to um, address this subject of, of hospitality and try and engage with your own title for, for the weekend. And to talk a little bit about the kinds of gifts that we receive in, in return from, from refugees. So this, this lovely title that you have for the, the whole conference in the shelter of each other that people live. Um, I don't know whether, I, I'm, I couldn't come up um, uh, yesterday, I don't know whether somebody spoke a, a little about the Irish proverb and its, its roots, but I was very taken um, with Padre Cotuma's reflection. He's written a book about it. So have anybody of you, any of you read it? There's a couple of nods, a couple of, a couple of raised hands. Um, he wrote, a, uh, he wrote a book, actually, that was focused on this, this proverb and gave a reflection um, that was on the BBC maybe three or four years ago. Um, and what he, he pointed out was the, the ambiguity, actually, of the statement um, that, that shelter can also mean shade and shadow. He went back through the linguistic roots from the Irish and looked also at the Old English and recognised that it was the same word. Um, shadow, shelter, protection, darkness, there were, there were real commonalities in these words. And if you think about it, it makes sense. You, you, take, you, you take shade from the elements, but it is the shade that also, also invites you into a kind of darkness. It's not, as you take shade from the elements um, for protection, you're not completely in the light. Yes, we live under one another's protection, but we also cast a shadow over one another. And the, the proverb, I think, captures those ambiguities rather beautifully, that we are mutually interconnected, we are interdependent upon one another, but there are also tensions in living alongside one another, particularly when there are different ways of life, um, in finding your own space to flourish when you live butting up against somebody else. 
somebody's protection can be another person's shadow and overshadowing. Um, so I, I was very taken with what he said, and it was kind of, I suppose, the starting point for my own thoughts about how I might address this topic as I was um, speaking to you today. And, and I, I want to start with the shadow, because um, unless we start with the shadow area, the place where um, asylum seekers in the UK are, are, are forced to live, it's very difficult to say anything very meaningful about anything else. So, so that's where I, I, I would like to, to begin. So the people who we serve at the um, Jesuit Ref Refugee Service in the UK, um, we serve particularly those who are made destitute by the asylum process and those who are held in immigration detention. And we've had that special ministry really more or less since we <coughs> began um, around 20 years ago. And it's become, I suppose, more of a particular um, expertise and focus um, as time's moved on. And we do that work because the Jesuits ask us to work with those who are most marginalised um, in the places where other people are not able to serve. Um, and because of uh, the support we have from the Jesuits and also from the wider Catholic community, we're in the very privileged position of being able to work with people that um, many other organisations would struggle to do because it's so difficult to get funding and support. We work with people who are the subjects of the hostile environment agenda. So you will have seen a lot of coverage in the last few months about Windrush, I imagine. It's kind of hard to miss it. But the point about the Windrush scandal was that what was happening to those people who came during the Windrush era um, under the hostile environment web of policies was, was accidental, if you like, at least. They were unintentional consequences. Whether it was completely accidental, perhaps we can debate. But they were not the intended subjects of this hostile, um, hostile web of policies. The difference with the people who we work with is that they are absolutely the intended subjects of the government's agenda, which changes, in a sense, the moral sphere with which we address the problem. Um, and it also makes it a lot more difficult to get movement on this issue. But everything that you saw in the press that was happening to people um, who came during Windrush era, all of the horrible situation about ending up in detention, being made destitute, losing their job, not being able to get treatment, um, not being allowed to work, the isolation, the fear, the suspicion that they came under, it's the same story. So, so if you're looking for a kind of image, a place to, place to go, um, somewhere to help you to understand what I'm about to say, that's a pretty good analogy. So what's it like to seek asylum in the UK? And where does the UK fit when we're thinking about the kind of wider issues around refugees? Stats is always difficult because people don't always have an instinctive grasp of what a statistic means. But I'll tell you there are around 65 million people displaced from their homes around the world, most of those people are displaced either within their country or to neighbouring countries, usually to some of the poorest areas of the world. The places that receive the most refugees are often the countries who are already poorest and already struggling. In the UK, we receive around 30,000 asylum applicants a year. So it's a tiny number. It's a really tiny number. Very, very few people actually make it here to claim asylum. But those who do make it here have a very difficult time. And those, those, who, um, but those who seek asylum have a really difficult time in the UK. So you, you get a small amount of money, um, a really small amount of money. It's, it's, it's not enough to buy a winter coat or um, a large item. Um, you'll get put up in some housing, it's probably not very good quality, you're likely to be moved around. Now any of those of you who are working with asylum seekers now will recognise this picture of dispersal, of real difficulty of living quite close to the, um, to the um, poverty line. But of course, that's what happens when you first seek asylum. So you get some financial support. The problem arises 
if you can't get the government to recognise that you are a refugee. That's when things really begin to become very difficult indeed. Now, why does that happen? You might, you might imagine, well, of course, you know, surely the system is fair. Surely it, it treats people fairly. They've been through a system. If somebody's been rejected, well, well, well you know, surely you know, they've, they've had their chance to prove their case. Well, unfortunately, that's really not the situation. So the, the asylum process is deeply and profoundly flawed. And everybody who looks at the asylum process has pointed out the flaws over and over and over again. Independent reviews, <coughs> charities, lawyers, there's hardly anybody who hasn't pointed this out. We've had Home Secretaries describe the Home Office as not fit for purpose, but we're still where we are. And the people who suffer from this are not the ministers who have to take the questions in Parliament, they're the asylum seekers who experience the system. Access to legal aid has also got a whole lot more difficult. The amount of time that a lawyer has to spend time with people to really look at the detail of their case, it's, it's much more difficult to get good quality legal advice. And everybody faces the same hermeneutic of suspicion that you saw with those who struggled from the Windrush era to get the Home Office to accept that they had a right to be here. Country information is often flawed. We've had all sorts of scandals about Eritrea, for example, but it's not the only place where the information that's used to decide whether or not you are a refugee is from dubious sources. Now, around 40% of those whose cases turned down initially get it overturned on appeal. That should give you some sense of how bad the initial decision making is. And we know that some people really struggle in particular to get a fair hearing. So if you're gay, you really struggle. If you've been a victim of sexual violence, you really struggle to get your case heard and understood. If you've converted, you really struggle to get your case taken seriously. People ask you some daft questions. They ask you some daft questions if you're trying to prove that you're a Christian. I mean, stuff I certainly wouldn't know. I mean, bizarre questions. And we see many of those kinds of cases in, those, um, in the people who we serve at the Jesuit Refugee Service. And once, you, once your case has been refused, that's when you become a subject of the hostile environment agenda. Now, what is this agenda? I mean, the new Home Secretary has been trying to rebrand it a compliance agenda. Um, when in doubt, give it a new name. Unfortunately, it's the same stuff. But it's a whole web of different policies aim to make life really difficult for you. Lots of different bits and pieces joined together, which is why it's, you can't just unpick one thread. It's to do with the ways in which data is shared, the fact that you're made destitute and you're not allowed to work. But on top of that, what's come more recently is that it becomes a criminal matter if you seek work. So. I, mean, I always find it extraordinary, actually, that the Conservative Party would criminalise working, but they have. Um, it becomes a criminal matter. Now, the implications of that are, are serious because it means it's much, more, it's much easier for you then to find yourself into a different bit of the criminal justice system so that you might find yourself <coughs> detained. But, of course, if you find yourself detained after having a criminal conviction, all sorts of things become a whole lot more complicated. So the web of policies makes it easier for you to find yourself in the criminal justice system. You're not allowed to rent property. There's also a question mark over whether it's okay for you to stay with your friend who's renting. And particularly if you're staying in the longer term because your landlord, your friend's landlord, can find themselves subject to criminal proceedings if they're renting to you who has no right to rent. So all sorts of people find themselves caught in this. All sorts of people are then forced to report that there is somebody here who doesn't have immigration status. What assets you had can be, can be um, claimed and frozen. Now, the new Home Secretary has actually put that on pause temporarily, but I don't have much faith that that won't be un uh, unpaused and they won't begin that all over again. But in the um, aftermath of Windrush, they realised they were freezing all sorts of people's um, assets who shouldn't have been frozen. You're not allowed to drive 
your access to the NHS is restricted, and of course you're liable to detention. So you just think about the kind of web of policies and the web of different things you can find yourself caught up in and what that really means for you. That means you have no money. You have no money to get the bus to see your solicitor, for example. Your ability to sort your case out gets a whole lot more difficult if you're moving around your friends, you're sleeping on successive sofas. How are you supposed to sort your paperwork out? when you're carrying it in plastic bags from one place to the next, and you've got no money to go and submit your fresh claim or your further evidence, because you have to do that in person in Liverpool. Now that means if you're living in London with friends or Birmingham with friends, you've got to get yourself there with no money because you've been made destitute. So you just can't sort it out. You find yourself trapped, trapped in, in the web of problems. And if you find yourself in detention, you have no idea how long you're going to be held there. Now, lots of people will get detained and then released. Some people get removed. Some people get moved around more than one detention centre. Some people are released and then detained again. They're released into destitution. Now, they used at least to be released into some housing, but now you're released also into destitution. This is a very, very difficult situation. And the impact of being in detention has devastating consequences on your mental health that don't go away, even after you're released. People feel very vulnerable afterwards, very afraid that that knock on the door will come again. They really struggle to process this, especially if the possibility of them resolving the immigration status that led them to be there in the first place has become even further away. There have been all sorts of scandals about the situation in detention. We've had Brookhouse expose. I think it's very easy in this situation to blame the private contractor and to find a few people to scapegoat. It's important to think that if you, and to remember that if you remove people from society so that they're not visible, and you do that against the background of demonizing those people who've been placed into detention, it is hardly surprising when they're treated badly. It's hardly surprising. And what's important is to understand that these are political decisions rather than just blaming the person on the front line. So I want to tell you a little bit further about some research we've done at the Jesuit Refugee Service into those who we see in our day centre, those who are destitute, and what the living situation is that they're facing. Because we were I mean, we, we had a sense that many of those people were, were sporadically street homeless, but we were still quite shocked, actually, by some of the things that came out of that research. What we found was that 62% of the people who come to our day centre who are destitute had been street homeless within the previous 12 months. Now, some of them were street homeless for extended periods of time, but a lot of them were sporadically street homeless. So they were the pattern of moving around multiple friends, hoping the friend will open the door to let them in, to give them shelter. And sometimes the friend didn't open the door, and that means that, that night you're sleeping on the park bench or in the night, on the night bus or in the all-night McDonald's. And it's this pattern of uncertainty, never really sure whether or not you're going to spend the night in the shadow or whether or not you're going to find shelter with your friend. But 34% of those people who did have somewhere to stay told us that they were frightened of the people that they lived with. It's like you to think about what that means and what people are doing to make sure that they have somewhere to sleep at night, particularly when it's cold and the risks that people are prepared to put themselves under. It's pretty sobering thought. And we see people who are young, who are old, who are sick, who are pregnant. We have a number of young women who are pregnant who would otherwise be street homeless if we were not able to support them. I think what makes this so difficult though is that it is not accidental. This is cruelty that's meted out in a deliberate way. It's cruelty that is a tool of government policy. 
and it's done with a purpose to try and get people to give up their claim for shelter, to give up their claim for protection. This shadow which is cast on people with such force is to force people to move out of what would otherwise be shelter, to stop people from seeking shelter of their friends, to stop others from being able to intervene. It is a deliberate cruelty, a deliberate attempt to stop people from thinking that they are safe. So within that context, at JRS, we've been conscious of trying to create spaces of welcome, spaces where there is a different kind of culture, a counterculture to this hostility. So that those who experience hostility might at least have some experience of hospitality. Those who experience isolation might find some place of community. People who are demonized might find some space a friendship. So in terms of what we do, we do quite a lot to meet practical support, physical needs, basic physical needs, but an awful lot of what we do is actually about offering friendship, about offering community, about being alongside people, about being with people. Now I said at the start that our, our mission is to accompany, to serve as companions and to advocate on behalf of refugees and this this mission of being with not just being for is at the heart of of what we do and it changes i think the whole way in which we interact with people and it is a mission which is founded on faith in god our, our charter says that um, to accompany is to affirm that god is present even in the most tragic moments of human history and i'll come back to that in a minute to explain what, in what way that has been so important for us. So I said we offer a mixture of kind of practical and emotional support. So for example, I, I work in, in detention. I have one of the staff team here hiding in the middle, B, um, and a beer teacher who's been manning the stall in the um, uh, sports hall who leads our outreach work into the Heathrow Immigration Removal Centre. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure if I don't answer questions at the end about this, you'll be able to go and ask her question, more questions about what it's really like to, to, to do that work. But we offer practical help in the form often of things like top-up mobile phone vouchers so that people can phone their solicitor or phone their family. But most of what we do is to arrange befriending, visiting, emotional support, keeping that connection up, a solidarity whether or not people are going to be released or whether or not they're going to be removed letting people know that in all of that uncertainty, they have the certainty that we are, we are with them and we will follow what's happening to them. Human contact, that's in a place that is in many ways really deeply dehumanizing. And in that space, relationships grow. It's not a clinical intervention, it's a human intervention with all the costs that that entails for both parties, for those who are befriending and the burdens they take when they leave the detention centre and those who are being befriended. In our day centre we offer practical help. We give people money so they can buy a bus pass and um, so that they can um, get to important appointments, perhaps to another day centre, a place where they can get advice, food, toiletries, a hot meal. But most of what we do is to be with people, to sit with them, to chat with them, to to eat with them at the same table. And it was that, I think, that had the effect on the Cardinal when he came to see us. We asked him whether he would enter into our mission with us. We said, we're not gonna put on a big red carpet VIP event. <laughs> what we'd really like you to do is to come and be a priest and be with the asylum seekers that we serve and spend time with them. Um, so we did, you know, the quick shoot round the volunteers and shook hands with everybody and then he spent almost three hours with us and most of that time was him sitting in the day centre listening to those that we serve eating food with them sharing conversation about all sorts of things and he was deeply moved and they were deeply moved that he had spent time with them and that he valued them enough to spend that time just being alongside them 
And we run activities too for similar reasons, so that people can develop friendships with one another, not just um, uh, with staff and volunteers, but that community can begin to grow and to develop. And we provide um, hosting, uh, a hosting service working with religious communities. This is one of the more moving things we do, actually, in terms of the immediate impact. We have, we have all sorts of extraordinary, um, uh, uh, particularly some of the women religious who work with us. I'm, I'm just amazed by um, some of the, the stories that they, that they tell and the impact of what they do when they open up their community to people who would otherwise be um, street homeless. And we've seen, I mean, I remember there was one gentleman who, um, uh, he was actually staying with the Jesuits, but he was one of the guys who I always used to chat to in the day centre, and he'd been trying unsuccessfully to teach me some Arabic, and um, taking the mickey out of me each week uh, for my failure to remember the last thing that he taught me. Um, but he was just really going downhill as the nights on the night bus began to take its toll. And then he was hosted, and the following week he, um, he came into the day centre and I called somebody out of the corner of my eye and I thought, we've got a visitor in the centre. Who hasn't told me they've invited somebody in? And I was just about to go and tell somebody off and think, who'd invited a visitor without telling the director? And then I realised it wasn't. It was the man who I normally speak to. But something about the way he was holding himself was so different. Having found somewhere where he was welcome and safe, where he could sleep, where he could wash, I was just amazed, amazed by the transformation in him. And we hear the similar kind of extraordinary and inspirational transformations when we listen to the, what the hosts get out of it. I suppose that was why I said I wanted to talk a bit about the gifts that we get from refugees, because some of the things that people say who work with us, um, sometimes they blow your mind. You think, gosh, wow, um, what, what they have... Um, what they have learned from what they've been doing. We had a reflection day a few weeks ago with um, some of our amazing hosts, and one of the um, uh, religious was talking about her own experience of how her community was diminishing in numbers, and they had been beginning to plan for um, what this meant for them. Um, as they were handing over ministries to other people, they were offloading much of the work that they were doing. But then they felt as if they'd been given a new ministry, a new calling from God to be able to welcome a refugee into their home. And what a transformation it had been for them to be able to be alongside somebody in that way and be in relationship and see something completely new. It was intensely moving to see what grace had been given to them for that, what was actually quite a courageous thing to do as a quite a small community to open themselves up to invite somebody to share their community life who was from a completely different culture, often a different faith, um, sometimes very good English, sometimes broken English, and yet what what life giving effect that had had on them was was just completely remarkable. We see so much in our work about the generosity of, of both volunteers and the refugees who we work with. We realise that for many of them, what gives refugees the most pain is this not being allowed to work while they're waiting for their refugee status to be recognised. Not being able to contribute, not being allowed to study, not being allowed to use their time in meaningful ways. It's taught me quite a lot, actually, about what's most important to human beings and this desire to give yourself to other people that, that seems to exist even after you take an awful lot of other things away. It's a, a kind of primal urge that you wish to be able to give yourself back to others. And we have a, um, a kind of loose volunteering scheme for people who wish to, um, some of those who are destitute, to be able to volunteer as part of our team. And it, it almost, it kind of unleashes this energy, really, that's been pent up and people have been so frustrated that they've got all these amazing skills and um, experience 
and knowledge that they're not able to give in somewhere else, in any other way and to enable them to, to use that in a way which is productive and, and fruitful. It really changes the way our team works um, and it's a remarkable thing to see. So our, our day centre, we um, uh, provide a hot meal and it's cooked by a chef who, who is himself a beneficiary. Um, he, he relies on um, uh, our own service for himself and yet he comes in every week and, and cooks meals with very little. We give him very little cash for the, um, for the food. I don't know how he does it really. Um, it's like the loaves and fishes really. He manages to produce these extraordinary feasts for a um, uh, hundred people and we get a bit of money from the local food bank and I think it's about £30 we're um, using to pay for meat and extra vegetables at the moment. But anyway, because he's a trained chef, he knows how to use almost nothing to feed everybody. Um, there you go, maybe Jesus is a trained chef. But then we have those kind of qualities. Um, but um, it's, I mean, it's just extraordinary what he, he manages to do. Um, one of the other volunteers who gives out the money for the bus passes relies herself on getting the money in um, uh, for bus passes in order to get there, to give out bus passes to others. But she does it in a way with such sensitivity and knowledge. Nobody else could manage that. Um, she does something that the staff couldn't do. There's something about the way in which she deals with people that for me embodies the spirit of our organisation much more than any of the staff. So in all that we do, it is that spirit of encounter which is at, at the heart of our organisation. And I, I think I've been reflecting a little on, on what it is, why is it that it is so transforming to be able to spend time with somebody who has a life that is so different to your own and to spend life, spend time with somebody particularly who has suffered so much at the hands of um, uh, injustice. I wonder whether or not it's just an, an encounter with what is true and that encounter with what is true about the world that you wouldn't otherwise see is in itself a kind of invitation to conversion, that you realise that there is something there that you haven't seen before, it opens your mind, it opens your mind to seeing a, a, a different way of a different way of the of the world. But I also have a, a real sense that we often meet God in these encounters with <laughs> refugees. I said that our mission and our charter says that to a company is to affirm that God is present, even in the most tragic moments of human history. When I listen to refugees' experience of their faith, it is very difficult not to hear those words that the Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's very difficult not to hear that when you listen to what people's experience is, their experience of God being very close to them. And so I wonder sometimes whether or not you have to draw into that shadow. I spoke about those words, the shadow and the shelter, maybe being the same. And when you draw into the shadow and you draw alongside people, sometimes that's where you see God, God's protection of others. That's where, for us, we get to see and meet the living God working, labouring ahead of us. It's in that space that real relationships start to develop when you draw alongside people and you hear what the refugees have to say about their lives and you share a bit about yourself that something magical seems to take place something true something transforming I'm going to leave some last words to Pope Francis he had um, there's a little paragraph from Gaudati et Exaltate that captures something of this for me he says, amid the thicket of precepts and prescriptions, Jesus clears a way to see two faces, that of the Father and that of our brother. He does not give us two more formulas or two more commands. <coughs> he gives us two faces, or better yet, one alone. <coughs> the face of God reflected in so many other faces. 
For in every one of our brothers and sisters, especially the least, the most vulnerable, the defenceless and those in need, God's very image is found. Indeed, with the scraps of this frail humanity, the Lord will shape his <coughs> final work of art. For what endures, what has value in life, what riches do not disappear? Surely these two, the Lord and our neighbour, these two riches do not disappear. <laughs> 